From the dawn of man, indigenous people from every corner of the globe have spoken of things that have now been discounted as myth or legend. Things they saw, lived alongside by, were looked upon as deities or worshipped by gods. Things that present-day man refer to as entities, spirits, demons, cryptid creatures, extraterrestrials and much more. But sadly, modern man, science and society has discounted what our ancestors spoke of as legend and myths. But there are those of us that know what the ancient ones spoke of is the truth. Those of us who are obsessed with finding out the truth. This search for answers brings us into the world of the unknown and unexplained. It brings us on the trail, in search of living legends. Please join us tonight in another part of our journey to find these answers and bring the truth out into the light. Welcome and thank you for listening. Hey, welcome everyone to another edition of On the Trail in Search of Living Legends. It's going to be Season 6, Episode Seven. I'm here with my partner, my brother, Mr. Nick Valenti. Nick, you feeling better, buddy? Uh, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm like 90% now. Um, just to mention to everybody, today is March 17th, 2024. And uh, our special guest today, I've been waiting for this one for the for the whole month, is uh, Deborah Hatswell. And how you doing, Deb? I'm doing really well, Nick. Thank you for asking me to come on. It's lovely to meet you finally face to face. Yes, okay. yeah, I know. We uh, talk all the time on Facebook and and communicate in Messenger. Now, folks, uh, if you don't know Debbie, uh, she's. I'll let her introduce herself more, but she's from across the pond. She's over between uh, Wales and Scotland in, in an area up there in a mountainous area, and she's had a lot of experiences um, Deb, how, how did you get started in uh, cryptozoology or did you get started in paranormal first or like give us a little bit of background? Um, I was 15. I never heard of Bigfoot or cryptozoology or I knew about ghosts and things. Don't get me wrong, but I had no real interest to it, into it whatsoever. Um, and I live in an area that is the least that you would think that somebody could see a cryptid of some kind, in all honesty. Um, I live in an area of England that's actually closer to, to Ireland than it is to, to, to London. So sheep country, lots of hills. And But I lived in a normal town, Nick. With a, we had a pit, we had a dock, you know, the, the harbour, and we had like a mill, and that was kind of, that was it for my town. And it was an old... Um, ancient mansion, if you can imagine, like something out of Harry Potter, mm. and it was a bit grounds itself, and it was just left to rack and ruin. It had been like that for the longest of time. I should have been going in school that afternoon um, and doing exams. I think it was probably about May time. It was warm, uh, and I decided that I wasn't going in, and I decided <laughs> with my friend that I wasn't going in either. So there was a place next to the old mansion. It was like all the gardens have over overgrown. They used to be beautiful, but they'd just been left to kind of rack and ruin and you could climb into. It was like a mixture of rhododendrons and ivy and things like that. So you could see out, but you couldn't see in. So it was ideal for hiding from the teachers. And that's what we were doing, to be honest. We were lay down laughing and talking and it was, it was lovely. It was a really, really nice day. And as I went like that, I saw movement in the in the bushes really and I I expected it to be a teacher or a boy that was going to go bah, you know and scare mm -hmm. us but it was a split second I mean when I described what happened it was a millisecond but basically I've looked I've made eye contact with something and this thing leant out of the bushes like this it's like the bushes moved and out he came um and I remember looking at him and I'm going to be really honest, I'm still ashamed of this to this day. I pushed my friend to the floor so that he'd get her. And I was up on my feet and I was running. And I looked back to see if he was coming after me. And she was running in the opposite direction. And he melded back into those leaves somehow. He just mm. went back into the shadows and he was gone. 
I didn't know anything about Bigfoot back then or anything like that. That all came later on with experiences. But I can tell you what he looked like. And yeah. to me, I always think of him as the man ape. He was, yeah. he looked like a man and an ape that had been pushed together somehow. Um, almost like, like a Neanderthal or a Heidelbergensis, something like a caveman of some kind. Very prominent brow ridge. Mm. Quite a flat nose, like a like you'd have if you were a boxer. So yep. quite a flat to the face nose. He had normal teeth, no canines or anything like that. They were like ours, but much bigger. Normal kind of lips like ours. His face was like dark and leathery. Um, and it was his eyes that I remember more than anything. I remember these muscles here. They looked like they could have just crunched through a bone. And he he looked quite shocked. To see him in the same way that I looked shocked to see him. Um, and the fear was just primal, Nick. He didn't do anything to frighten me, but I've been presented with something that's completely impossible. Right. And I, I just ran. But looking back in hindsight, now I'm in my 50s, he was a some hominid of some kind. He was definitely looked like a brother or a cousin to us in some way, like we were back in the day. And I hit the ground running then, but I was so frightened. I didn't want to go. I obviously had to go back to school the next day, told my parents and everything, and they didn't really believe me. My dad did, but my mum didn't. They thought I'd seen a homeless man or... It was nothing like that. He was absolutely thick muscle. I only saw him from the chest up, so I can't tell you anything about hands or arms or anything like that because he lent out with this part of his body. Very little neck. And you could see skin through his hair, and it looked like a black bear, but where the sun was hitting it, it was almost red in colour. Mm. Okay. And that's what I remember the most about him. It, it, it just the, the description of him and the way that he looked. And this thing where he's melted back in. And it took me 30 years when Thomas Markham, who runs a crypto crew. Yeah, um, no time. They, yeah, I'd got into cryptology by then and he'd shared, I'd, I'd sent a number of witnesses over to him because, I, you know, as um, Jeremiah, I get witnesses contacting me from all across the world. And he yeah, sent me a, a, te a message one day on Facebook and I looked at it and it, it was a newspaper report and I just thought, well, I said to him, right, I'll have a look at it later. And he went, no, Debbie, you need to look at it now. It's someone from your town. So I goes on it and I looked and it was, it was a lady and she'd reached out to Thomas and said, I saw my mate in... 82. She in 1984, she's in the same park, in the same spot, but it's winter time for her. She's walking the dog and she said, I see this thing just stood there. It looked like a chimp. It had a bit of a hunch to its back. It had a pot belly. It was clearly male. You could see genitalia and it was covered in hair from head to toe. And she said it just looked at her. It just sat there and like stood there and just looked at her. It didn't do anything at all. She's picked the dog up and she's run. Um, and she described it as like a man and a chimp together. Mm. So we're getting this ape again and this this man. And you find that a lot in the UK. Very rarely will they use the word Bigfoot, but they'll say right. wild or caveman or ape man, gorilla man, right. chimp man, boom man. You know, that's because we didn't really, in 1982, I hadn't heard of Bigfoot. I don't think many people had, really, to be honest. Yeah. Do you have any idea, uh, estimate of how tall? Mm. At the time, Nick, I thought he was about 10 foot tall. He was like this mm. monster, this huge monster. And he, I, I didn't go back. I didn't go back to the park till 2015. It took me that long to go back, really. Wow. And I went back with um, the crew of Finding Bigfoot. They were looking for a location site to film. And I'd explain to him that I lived, you know, what I class as a town. For me, I live in a town. And, and when they, we were in the car traveling and he kept saying to me, so where's the town? And I was like, but this is the town. And he was like, no, this is not a town by American standards. You know, this is kind of out there, Deb. And I was able to put my husband in the, the spot where he was. It was all still there. And I would say he was about seven, seven and a half feet somewhere around there uh, not the 10 feet that I thought he was but I think that's fair and the average really in the UK is normally between about seven feet about six to seven and a half feet when it comes to uh, wild man sighting yeah most people right yeah they don't get quite as big as they we see here I don't think mm, I 
it's a small island, isn't it? And a lot of people yeah. out there yeah. thinking it's absolutely impossible. There is not enough wilderness in the UK for a relic hominy to uh, remain right. here. Less than 10% of the UK is urban. And that includes roads, hospitals, airports. So less than 10% is actually built upon the ground. The rest mm. of it is arable or woodland grounds. A lot of it's owned by the government or mm. military of defence. And that's where the dogman reports come in much later on. Um, I had to do what other witnesses don't have to do. I had to come up with all of the frequently asked questions that started when Patty was seen. So way back to the year I was born, 67, what are they? What, you know, what possibly could they be? What are the theories behind them? Are they flesh and blood? Are they dimensional in some way? Do they leave footprints? Do they build? Do they have food stashes? You know, do they have this map like bears where they know every food resource and every medicine that's out there? Because they learn it at the mother's knee and they have these migrationary routes. So my background, my work background, is in mapping and geological profiling. And I realised very, very early on as a team that if I found any other reports, I needed to put them on a map so that I could see what was the same about those areas. And could I go from, say, London right. to Manchester and be able to navigate around the towns and conurbations? And I realised that I think they're using the rivers. We get lots of reports... Yeah around the estuaries so where the map even in the Thames Valley London is you'd be amazed how many reports that people have made around because there's um there's two river sources that run through and around London and they come from the estuary and I think they use those those river sources to move throughout and every now and again if we're really really lucky someone will get a spot of one and nine times out of ten it's a male a big tall thickly muscled some mm. kind of gorilla man yeah well, Debbie, you've got to think it. It makes sense because, you know, if they're if they're living and breathing, they need water, so yeah. they're going to be near the water, and water has fish in it too, so they can grab that, and uh, it's also a way for them transportation without being seen very easily. So I, I, I can see I can see your point there. Yeah, I remember when Jeremiah had his sighting. It was along the trail line. Once it there was a train track there. Yeah. Yep. And yeah, I've the one in North in North Carolina, the one you interviewed me about. Yep, right on the train, yeah. the train track. Mm -hmm. You look at the Canadian reports and look at reports in the US. Look at the Russian reports. Look at the reports in the uh, UK and all across Europe. Railway lines play a very important part. At mm. night time, no trains on them, so it's a, an easy route. You get a lot of roadkill along them. You get a lot of carrying that will pick at the deer that they find on there and things. Yep. And I think that they use any route that is easier and will keep them away from a human being. Um, yeah, I mean, and you would see them, you know, you wouldn't see them at night in the dark moving along. There's no, where I live now, when I go outside, the streets are lit. But when you get onto the main roads, like the, the motorways, the highways, as you would call it, there's no lighting. It's just black when you're driving. So anything that we get the road crossing reports of creatures stepping out of one side crossing in front of the car and going into the woodland on the other side that's the same in Canada isn't it same in the US no matter where you go these habits that pop up all of the time they're leaving prints people are getting hair DNA samples because um, there are they are out there people don't believe that they're a, a big there are that we I mean we know that ourselves don't we that they're they are out there it's just because the government won't release them kind of thing if it, we were able to prove that they were um, a corporeal flesh and blood creature, all of your logging would stop, your mining would stop, your building new homes would stop. You would yep. have to put habitat aside for them. It's all about the mighty dollar. And it's exactly the same in the UK, you know? Yep, always has been. So it's always been about. Absolutely. 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 Back in the day for me, what I did was, there was no internet, there was no Google, there was nothing like that, but we had CB radio. And the area that I live in is so high up, we actually have a massive radio mast that goes up. It's like a foul, I think it's a thousand feet above sea level. And people would go up there in the 80s and the 90s and get on the CB radio. And I thought, right, well, I'm going to do that. So I started finding people are driving the roads, like truck drivers and delivery drivers. And I'd speak to people in America and get as many 
just as much information as I could soak in. Because the only thing that fitted for me with what I saw was what I later learned was Bigfoot. And that was because I came across the Sykesville monster. And seeing him changed everything for me. I I should say, growing up, my dad took us, we fished, we hunted, we camped out. We went to every woodland, every, every lake and river in the UK. And once that happened at 15, that was it for me. I, no, there's no way was I going back in a woodland. And I didn't take my children back in either. I robbed them of that because I was frightened. I was just so, so frightened that I'd, he'd get me. I don't know why. Now it seems silly. But then he was this monster. And I thought that he'd, I'd seen him and he's not going to want people to know that I've seen him. I know it's very different now, but I was thinking with a child's mind, wasn't I? But now there's seven people in my town from the 1950s to 2021 that have come forward and said, I've seen it too. And the only thing I could get that looked like it, because I'm looking through Google, I've got to find something that looks like it. And I found that Sykesville monster. Oh, Jeremiah. It was like going back to that day. No, oh, man. Drew the laptop, I had a good, I was crying. My husband's going, Debbie, what's wrong, what's wrong? And I kept saying, that's him, that's him, that's that thing, that's that thing, but how can it be? Because he's in America and I've mm. seen it here. But it looked like his brother or his cousin. Yeah. They, they look so similar. Um, and that Sykesville was done from a number of witnesses, wasn't it? From a police um, oh, yeah. put together. And Alex Evans did that for me. She started with the Sykesville monster and she said, right, Debbie, tell me what's different about him. And I said, he, he, he needs much thicker jaws. His mandibles were much bigger than that. And that's what she did. She built it out for me. And I said, so it's not 100%, but that is the closest I've ever seen that somebody's been able to take out of my head what's in there and show you, you know, and say, this is what I saw that day. And I think since then I've been trying to prove that. That's what I saw. I didn't lie. I didn't make it up. I didn't want to see it. I really wish I hadn't seen it. But if I hadn't had done, I wouldn't be doing this now, would I? No. No. no? You no. know? Life's no. a funny thing. <laughs> I think you, um, back when I interviewed you, you know, four or five years ago, uh, you sent me that picture and it, it blew my mind. Because you're right. It looks like something like a homo erectus or... Yeah. Uh, you know something something along those lines it, it just it blew me away when i when i saw you put, it. You put, you put clothes on it it just looked like yeah. a human laughing you know just just absolutely astounded but then i i, I realized that i need, needed to look down the hominid line if i'm going to say that they're here in the uk i've got to prove that they're here in the uk hide up mm. against this here in the uk they were the first yeah. It's to come down from the trees and start to build structures. And those structures look like the things that we find in the woodlands today because that's what human beings did. And their footprints are far more human looking than the okay. native American footprints. So it kind of fits with that for me. So in my head, I think of him now as like Homo ferus, like the wild man. He has the best diet available. He All he has to worry about is food, shelter and water. And if he's got those three things, and if he hasn't, he can move a mile down the road or two miles, they follow the day and they follow the food. And I've been yeah. able to prove that simply by mapping every single report that I have ever come across goes onto a map. And I've been able to see a seasonal pattern. And it's the same in the US. Around October, November, when we have the yep. harvest, everything starts to go quiet. The signs disappear out of the woods. The long-term habituators are not seeing sign anymore. We get to spring, depending on the weather. It could go from January to the first week of March. But you watch that weather, and when the garlic and the food starts coming up, then we start to get sighting reports again. So they've yep. got to same have here. Yeah, exactly the same. It's the same. same world. And it, you just yep. think, why? so for me this year, there was none last year. We had none. 2021, we had two. In separate parts of the country on the same day. Two different That's people awful. don't know each other. One of them, down south, it had flooded and the banks had flooded the river. The, the rivers had gone into the fields and as the rivers receded, the water stayed in the field and he's fishing it. And this guy's driving to work one morning really, really early and he said, I just see this thing as I'm driving and I'm, I'm trying to keep my eye on the road. There's no other cars about or anything. He said, and it's all covered in hair and it's shielding its face against the water and it looked like it was fishing with its hand. 
And I thought, well, people do that the world over when we would take advantage of that as a human being. So I write all that down and I'm on the phone and I get all of that with him. And then the next day, a guy from where I live, so we're talking three, 400 miles away, says, sure. Debbie, I've seen something this morning. You know, I've been out, I've been out to my usual place and there's something there. So it, uh, that was great for me because I was able to think, well, I'm onto something. There is a seasonal pattern. Where do they go? <laughs> Where do they go? But they do right. have a seasonal pattern when you think about it. It kind of fits in with the rut. So it was quiet as they're rutting. And you know yourself, a deer will hold back its embryo till the weather's great, and then it does what it needs to do. If that creature's following that deer as a food source, it's going to be wherever those deer are, isn't it? And it could go mm -hmm. underground, it's subterranean. There's so many possibilities. But spotting those patterns is what I'm good at, I think. Yeah, there is a lot of, there's a lot of possibilities. You know, where do they go when, you know, during the off season, you know, it, it's, it's kind of mind boggling, you know, it's, it's, like you said, there's so many, so many possibilities. Yeah. Where do they go when they're sick or when they're giving birth? Right. Because that's, the, yeah, that's the most, the, you know, it's a time in a female's life when you're at your most vulnerable when you're giving birth. Sure. So they've got, for me, I believe, my personal opinion is, they have areas where the old, older ones are. And the females, and that's why the majority of sighting reports that we see are male. I believe 100% that Patty, why would you have shown yourself? Why would you not have just stayed in that woodland so Patterson and Gimlin had gone past on that horse? I think she was leading them away from the area, and you would only do that for something that's vulnerable, like you're young. So we've got a change yep. in the pattern there at Bluff Creek. It, we've had this flood. Everything's different. They're going on the migratory pattern. And all of a sudden, all that bush and cover's gone. You know, and unfortunately, as they've been coming on the horse, I think she's led them away. I think she's done what they do. She's walked off and circumvented and come back around. And that's just my my opinion, you know. Very rare no, that's to see. A, that, that's a very plausible theory. I mean, it, it really is. Like you said, leading them away, you know, from something she's protecting, mm. you know. So you just you you stay hidden, wouldn't you? You you you, yeah. you think you, you just stay hidden, and they wouldn't know you were there, and it'd be over. Right. Obviously, put herself in danger. She's done that for a reason, and for me, that would be my my children, my young. It would be right. You guys stay here, and I'm going to lead them off. You know, and once they follow me, you go that way. I think any tribe, any human, any ape. I think that is a natural thing to do. Yeah. Absolutely. Especially for a mother. Yeah. Yeah. Especially for a mother. Yeah. 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 That's especially it. for a mother. Yeah. I can see that the only way, you know, of her putting herself in danger like that would be for her young. Yeah. You're risk group you're, you know, I agree risk. with you. It just, yeah. it, 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 to me, when people say she's not real, I think, well, that's absolutely ridiculous. That's a female covered in hair. When she walked, that is a female covered in hair. That's not a suit. It's not a, a man in a suit. No. She's no. a female. Those breasts do what mine do. They would naturally have a sway to them. You could tell that she'd had young, you know. I once interviewed a female, a woman, and she said to me, no, Debbie had breasts. It, she said it looked like a man running down the motorway. It's about eight foot tall, completely black covered in hair, but it had breasts. And she said, and it had breasts like it, it fed. It fed young ones. And mm -hmm. I, I just thought that a woman would know that. You know, mm. we would we would know. And she said, I'm telling you, Deborah, there's females of them out there. And that's that they're incredibly rare. But the one that's just come in now, second of March, a female, and that's so rare for England. So, so rare. So I've not mm. even had chance to like really work on the report yet. But yeah. uh, you know, long term habituation site up in the northwest of England, well, like right where I am. She's on the back step having a smoke, but I one in the morning. And she said, I thought. What's that thing on the fence? And she's thinking, a neighbor, neighbours have put something there. And she said, the security lights are going off like mad, and I can't work out what it was. And I'm thinking, is it a fox? Is it a cat? She said, and as it moved, its hair moved. She said, but my fence is six foot tall, and there's a trellis on that. And this thing was taller than the fence, and it looked like a female. And when she was a kid, she used to see what she described as the monkey people. And she said to me, oh, my God, it's one of them. It's one of them. And she just ran in, shut the door, and obviously she was absolutely terrified. And I said to her, just get more lights up, make a lot of noise. You know, if you don't want them around there, 
you're not happy about it, get yourself an air on, do whatever you need to do. Um, okay. and, and like move them on that because we're not allowed to, you know, in the UK, we're not we're not allowed to keep guns or anything like that. Right. But you've got to tell people to be if you're frightened, you've got to give them a way of not being frightened, and you've got to say, sure. I said to her, it'll do anything. I think you've just caught it out. She's probably gone that way so many times at half past one in the morning, and you've just been there and you've caught it out and it's froze. It's done that natural thing that they do where they freeze. How many oh. witnesses that? If you haven't moved, I want to see. They're good at that. They're they are notoriously good at blending in and hiding themselves definitely the hide and seek champion of the world <laughs> without a doubt without a doubt they are i mean but how did i go from being that 15 year old girl to now interviewing people all across the world about the strangest of things that happened to them i mean i i never thought it would it would happen to me either no. <laughs> you know <laughs> just as it works out that way and then I realized, I realized it about 15 years into it. I suddenly realized that these people reporting like dogman like creatures and nobody's mm. running down in the UK. Nobody's doing anything with them, just poo pooing the witnesses. And I'm thinking, well, they've just got as much right to say what they've seen as I have. To Absolutely. say, well, you know, why would I disbelieve them kind of thing? Um, and I've met some people who are solicitors doctors, policemen, the army, very credible witnesses that you would listen to in court that are not believed because what they've seen is outside the realm of possibility. You know, and that's just not on that, is it really? My God. Are, are you getting a lot of dog man reports right now? Or more than, yeah, more than anything. I've got some really good cases that have come in recently. Um, I think it might be the same for you guys over there. You heard about the hitchhiker effect, where people are seeing or experiencing something in the woods and then things start to happen at home, around the fence, yeah. around the garden, like they're being followed home. So I've had, since 2017, I've had a number of people get in touch with me who have been out walking the dog or out just having a walk in nature and they've been kind of shadowed by something within the woodland. That mm -hmm. Some of them have seen it and described it as, you know, all black in colour, snouted, ears on top of head, like a, an Alsatian or a, a German shepherd-shaped mouth, hands and feet as a burst of paws. Um, and those things start to happen at home. So it's another thing where you say to people, you've got to up your security, you know, you've got to make a lot of noise around the house and don't be feeding it, don't be inviting it in in any way, shape or form. Because right. once you stop feeding, it could get silly for you. Yeah. But I think one case is it's probably the hardest one I've ever worked, Jeremiah. And it was the hardest one that ever I ever worked because the, the witness actually died while I was working with them. And oh. that's really, really hard for me to have dealt with. But that's what happens when you do my job. There's a, a chap who lived, he was um he was very old. He was almost 80. And he lived in Bedfordshire, which is down south in the UK. It's beautiful. It, it's like what the Americans imagine the UK look like. It's in these little like, thatch cottages. It's absolutely beautiful. And he lived in an, on a, a remote farm, really. And his carer has been there for 20 years. And for about 20 years, there's been really strange things going on in the property. So things banging on the walls. Well, they'd go outside in the morning and they'd find these really strange dog prints, but like with a long heel. And But we managed to not tell Fred. So the witness, is, the guy who lives there is called Fred. And we don't want him scared because he's old mm. and he's ill. So we kind of dealt with it privately. It was his partner that got in touch with him and said, all oh, this is going on. Can you help? So unfortunately, his partner passed away. And the night before that happened, there... They were no, it was actually I'm wrong. The night after it happened, after his partner passed away, the, the, the document prints were at the window again. That was 2018. So I just talked to him backwards and forwards because he's a lovely old man and he lives in Bedfordshire and we have telephone conversations, but we don't mention the cryptid side of things, never have done with him. It's just not a conversation that we have. The 8th of September, just gone, 2023. I was going in hospital actually to have a procedure. So I'm up on the ward and I've got me going on like yeah when you're in hospital my phone goes and it's the carer and he's never ever ever just rang me like that and I thought hey that's strange and I looked and it put Deb urgently please phone please phone so I thought I'm gonna have to do it so I sneaked out got in my car and I <laughs> rang him and I said what's wrong 
and he said, oh, God, we've had to get the doctor out to Fred. It's really, really bad. He's seen something at the window last night. And he's absolutely hysterical. Can you speak to him? And I said, yeah, of course I can. Put him on the phone now. So he gets on the phone and I said to him, like, what's wrong, Fred? And he said, oh, Debbie, there was, there was a werewolf. There was a werewolf at my window and it banged. It banged on the window. And it looked really surprised to see me. So I thought, oh, God, can you imagine being in the middle of nowhere? And you're really, really old and frail and you see that. So I said to him, do you mind if I ask you a few questions? And he was like, no, not at all. I said, are your parents Irish by any chance? And he went, yeah, my family are Irish. And I said, and have you been thinking about death and passing on? And he said, yeah, I have actually. I've sat down with a solicitor and I've done me will and I've done all of those things. And I said, is there somewhere on your property that's really, really negative? And he said, yeah, there's an old abandoned farmhouse and whoever lives there had kind of gone in and done like occult things and demonic to raise all the dead, you know, and summon the dead and all of these things. But it's also old priory land. And the legend is that a number of nuns were pregnant and buried babies on that land. So can you imagine you've got all that? Oh, going God. Mm. So I said, what was different about last night? Because you've lived there your entire life. You've never seen anything. What changed? And he said, I can't do the stairs anymore. So my carer had brought the bed from upstairs and put them down in the front room and like the lounge. So for the first time ever, he's not where he would normally be, asleep. And I remember he said, it looked surprised to see me. It looked shocked that I was there. And in Ireland, there's a, there's a legend that's passed down and it's called the Death Wolf. And it's not as bad as it sounds. It almost comes to protect you at the time when you are about to pass on so that nothing can get your soul kind of thing. Um and he, all he wanted to know, Jeremiah, was, was would it come back for him? And I said, no, if it was going to come, if it wanted you, it would have took you there and then. You would have just been one of the missing nobody had ever known. I said, it's clearly curious about you for some reason. And I explained it to him. I said, I think it's because you're getting near the end of life and your thoughts are out there and you're frightened. You're frightened of passing on. Everybody is. That's normal. I said, and you're probably frightened that something you've done in your past is going to send you to hell. I said, and that's normal for every single person out there. And as long as you really, really regret it and you're sorry, then that won't happen. You'll be absolutely fine. And it was strange in a way. It really did help him because he took him to hospital. And when he was at hospital, he realised that he had this really bad infection on him. Mm -hmm. So he managed to stay in the hospital and he got him better again. But he just wanted to come home. He just got sent to me, I just want to come home, Debbie, and die in my own bed. And I was like, well, I get that. I understand that. And that's what happened the uh, first week of January this year. So he died in his bed, um, quite happily, uh, with his friend, his friends and his family around him and his dog on his knee. But that was probably one of the hardest cases I've ever worked. But if I hadn't have written it down, it would have just gone into obscurity. Yeah, Nobody would have ever heard that story, you know. It just nope. would be so sad. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, Nick, we've got something, like you were saying, Debbie, about when people are getting ready to cross over these things come around we've got a similar legend here nick you want to take that take take that part on about the the dogman guarding the native american burial mounts yeah deb um uh, all my research that goes back into the 1700s specifically the native american indians uh, a lot of that i mean they don't speak to us directly but they do have records that yes. they left and in studying the records in the libraries and such, uh, there have been many cases where um, people have seen dogman mm -hmm. at the cemetery areas of Native American Indians. Mm -hmm. Native American Indians are, are prepped and they're put in cloth and they're buried with their valuables, with jewelry, uh, stones, precious metals and such. Um, people, uh, well, white, white man, already yeah. here, they violated those graves and uh, to their detriment. Yeah. Actually, because as the stories do go, uh, the dog man, the spirits of, or the, uh, I, I mean, I mean, this is what, this is what goes between spiritual and being uh, corporal. Yeah. Uh, I guess they may have turned into uh, solid bodies, but they went after these people that mm -hmm. dug up the graves, stole the jewelry, from the Native Americans that were buried there, 
And these people ended up torn apart and, of course, dead. And the yeah. uh, jewelry missing. Uh, I mean, this goes back to the early 1700s, before, yeah. this was, before the United States was even a, a country. And, yeah. it, and it followed, I mean, the last, the last records I, I read were from 1801. Mm -hmm. And um, that's going back into the Old West and going up into the uh, Michigan area, uh, Minnesota areas and the like. Uh, the French trappers uh, were some of the most, um, <laughs> well, the, the biggest violators of stealing, you know, grave robbing actually is what I want to put it. I'm trying to put it nicely, but there's no way to put it nicely. And um, one fellow in particular, he, um, he, he, he took one piece with him and he went, he, he escaped his, his other two partners. They had canoes laden with uh, beaver skins and, and deer skins and the like. And out of the three of them, he's the one that least wanted to rob graves, but he did take one piece. He did get away. The other two trappers were killed. They were torn apart. About 10 years later, they finally caught up with him. Mm -hmm. Well over 120 miles away from the wow. site. And, you know, he, he, he was older at the time. And uh, his family went to go check on him because he didn't come to dinner. And nobody saw him during the breakfast. Nobody saw him during the lunch. Now, mind you, they had forts that they lived in. Yeah. And they had their own little, you know, shacks or homes inside the forts. So whatever the creature was that got in, and most likely it's a dog man, got in, tore him apart. Uh, his, be his, um, his, his possessions were torn apart also. And that in this one box where his niece noted that he had this one piece of silver jewelry with a uh, green gemstone, it was missing. Uh, man, he was torn apart like a bear had gotten in and just ripped him apart. He was eviscerated. And, uh, you know, he was dead. And this has gone back to the uh, late 1800s because he was an older man by then. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there's there's part of the, uh, the lore. Of, it, it still uh, stands, I think. To this day, if you look at modern day dogman reports, I guarantee there'd be a cemetery or a burial site really close by. Oh, sure. Yeah. There, there is something to connection somewhere, isn't there, to death and the burial sites and these dog headed men, as they call them. Mm -hmm. uh, ancient burials in England, you, you might be digging up a grave that's 14,000 year old, right, 12,000 yeah. yeah. old. You and you build a school or a hospital on that, and people don't understand that the essence of that land is still there. You can build on it as much as you like, but that land is still there. And, and if you disrespect it and you do it wrong, then some people get attached almost like what I would call like a skinwalker. So mm. something that can be metaphysical, it can be physical. I think the, what do the Germans call it? Schudenfreud. So you can be in one world or another and you can change your metaphysical person as you mm. do. Yeah. But there is definitely a correlation between burial mounds and, and, and dogman creatures. Absolutely. You know? Deb, I had an encounter back in September of 2013. Right. I actually saw a dogman and I didn't know what it was at the time. Uh, I was into cryptozoology, but I thought it was a werewolf. But at the same time, you know, this is later. I, at first, I thought it was a large bear, but at seven and a half plus feet tall, that's not a that's not a black bear. But mm -hmm. what I found out, Watchung Reservation is where I had the encounter. Yeah, I, it took me three years to uh, put a name to it. Yeah. Because I investigated it and kept investigating it. And then it, it took another four years before I found out that the area, the Wachung Reservation, mm. are, was a uh, site where the Lenape Native American Indians were at. And I also found out when I dug a little bit deeper, because they have a museum over there. Right. Uh, and I asked the museum curator, I mean, it's right on the property. They have a large museum and they have a big uh, portion of the museum dedicated to the Lenape Indian. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's a fascinating uh it's really fascinating what they show you about them. 
they show you about their teepees made out of bark, tree bark. And anyway, I asked the curator about that. And he said that it's not put out. And he asked me not to really say locations, but he did show me a location where the Lenape Indians had a, had a burial ground in that right. area. And yeah. I'm telling you, I measured it and it was not more than uh, 900 to 1,000 feet away from where I had the encounter, where I actually yeah. saw a dog wow. man. And yeah. um, I remember that night as if it was yesterday. Uh, after a little while, the creature walked off into the woods. I could hear it crunching the leaves, crunching the, uh, the twigs. And there was a, um, a large, bright, white object in the sky. Mm -hmm. about 120 to 140 feet away in the direction that it that it walked off into it right. walked into the forest area and then i couldn't hear anymore and i got back in my vehicle at that point but i do know that it did walk off into the direction of the lenape native american indian burial ground so there's there's a lot of stuff that we've been putting together over the years that we've been learning more and more you know about you know, just the pieces about what, what's put together. I'm wondering, Jay, if, you know, all the um, encounters or sightings that people have had, if there are Native American burial grounds in those areas. Yeah, I can tell you what, 25, 20, you know how close I live to the reservation. Right. I, I, I'm 10 minutes down the road from the Mohawk Reservation, and this is an extremely active area for Dogman and Bigfoot. Mm. And so I, I truly, and they'll tell you the same thing. They don't, I'm part Native American, so they'll talk to me a little bit, but they won't, they still won't come out with it all. <laughs> but, they, you know, they have, they've mentioned what Nick was just saying, that they're in relation to the burial ground, the burial mounds. Yeah. And whether you know. you're Native, because you've got that Native American blood within you, I yeah. mean, it sounds a bit romantic, but when you think about it, your ancestors have been on that land, that land for millennia. And I Absolutely. believe in genetics. I really do believe in genetic memory. I think that's the reason we can go to places and just feel so at home. And, and you don't even know, you didn't know that you had an ancestor that lived there before, you know? And I think Absolutely. they know intent. I think they know our intent. So if you're going in and you're going in in a respectful way, I think they walk away. But I think if you go in like with camo and you, you're out to hunt, I, don't, I think you, I once said to a man who told me he was going to, he said, I'll get you the arm of one. I said, well, write your, your phone number on your arm, then it make it really easy to identify your body. How ridiculous. You know, this this <laughs> 800 pound cryptid and you're going to go in with your little BB gun and shoot it. And I just <laughs> said to him, I don't, I don't understand the mentality of that. And he said, well, I want to prove it's alive. I said, but you've seen it. So you know it's alive. What you want to do is right. prove it to somebody else, you know, and you don't get the right to shoot somebody or something for that. And I said to him, do you know what would happen? It wouldn't just be you that would pay. It would be your sons and your next sons and your next sons because you're taking out an ancient, one of our ancients, you know. You're supposed to have respect for that, aren't you? you Regardless. Yeah. And it, it's there, and I think that's probably why Nick's in. I was actually going to say to Nick, have you got any Native American blood in you? No, do I you have... Uh... Total, totally pure Italian blood in me. Uh, I'm right. actually first generation, you know, coming over here, right. uh, you know, a naturalized an American. Uh, my parents are from the opposite side over there in Italy. Um, uh, some of the some of the stories that my uh, my grandmother on my mother's side of uh, that she told me because they're from Rome. She's mm -hmm. Roman Italian. And um, some of the stories that her mother, her grandmother told her and, and they passed on over the years that uh, I guess they had people in the Roman legions and uh, yeah. they actually came yeah. up against a, I guess you would call it a small army of wolf. Men, yeah, the sign of Cephala. I really wish I could have yeah. gotten, I really wish I could have gotten my hands on the the journal that, that uh, my, I guess... <laughs> Yeah. Great, 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 great grandfather kept. Um, and uh, by the way, that's that's a lot of where I got the um, the, tr the French trapper story is yeah, actually yeah. they kept journals back then. 
Hmm? Yeah. Go up and down the uh, the rivers in the United States, you know, and they would uh, hunt and, uh, you know, beaver and uh, deer and stuff and take it back. But they would write journals where they were. They would give locations. Yep. But same thing with um, my mom's side of the family, the Romans. I, I wish to God they had some, but they left them over there. Instead of taking them over, yeah. they took over extra clothes and extra belongings. They They left their books there because they were only allowed a certain amount of pounds to come over on a ship way, way, way back then. Yeah, yeah. And it would be serious back then, wouldn't it? But you mean, there's documentary reports all across Europe. People don't tend to believe me when I tell them that. And I say, oh, oh yeah. Right. Even, in the, even in the Scandinavian countries, people oh, are still reporting Bigfoot-like creatures and Dogman-like creatures. Mm -hmm. And the distinction between the two is that snout. Yep. So I never tell a witness what they see. I always say to them, describe it for me. And yep. this, I think there are different descriptions with the dog people because some people will say a tail, ha a horse, you know, and, and, and you think, and it's very dog-like, like a typical werewolf, but others describe what I would call um, a wolf man. So a male's body, a human male, hands and feet, no tail, but completely hair covered. And then yep. in Europe, you get this massively thickly built, what they believe to be hybrids. Yeah. Even, even in Hitler's journals, they talk about the hidden people in Poland and the fact mm. that a lot of children were taken down into those underground bases and were hybridized. I mean, look at the, the, the we know about what Hitler did with his genetic experiments. He tried yeah. to make a, a, a super soldier as did Mussolini. So we Stalin, know- Stalin as well. Yeah, we, we were trying to make these super soldiers. And it comes into one of the things that I'm, I'm really passionate about. Why do we see them on military of defense land and military of defense bases? You know, what is the connection there with these beings? Just in, in England, it's all of the, the Northeast coast. <clears throat> So right from Dover, you know, like the white glitter Dover, you get used to seeing that. From there, all the way to the tip of um, Scotland, there are dogman reports all along that, and each and every one of them is within about 10 miles of a military base. Right. And most of them are actually on the military land. Mm. And yet, that's, wow. that, to me, that's fascinating. Wherever we build battlement to keep out the Germans, there are stories of people even modern day stories of people seeing dog like creatures you know so we've got yeah. to be a connection you know Deb, yeah. this, the, the interview is is, a, is mostly about your stuff and not me but something i want to mention because you know, we asked asked where i was from yeah i'm going to be traveling later on this year back to italy and i'm going to meet up with my on my father's side my relatives and yeah. i am going to rome and I'm going to meet up with my uh, cousins and I guess third and fourth cousins, uh, whoever's alive over there on my mom's side. And I'm very interested to see because I understand that they've kept archives. They've kept diaries. They've kept books mm -hmm. uh, on things going way, way, I mean, way past. And it would be phenomenal to be able to, you know, look through these books and perhaps see a drawing. Yeah, you know? or them ask you ask your cousins and that if they've ever experienced yeah. anything strange yeah, yeah. You know, i mean i, I want to see if they have anything because yeah. according to what my grandmother said on my mom's side they kept a lot of books going yeah. back way back when so i our first stop is going to be in rome so i'm going to see those relatives yeah why not i mean i didn't i didn't know what my dna was i wasn't uh, sure so I actually did a test. Um, so my grandmother was like one of 10 children. Um, and I think my grandfather was like one of 13. So it was like a really fragmented family. And I've got uh, like Roman Gypsy on each one of my family lines. So oh, wow. I'm not really sure where I was from, to be honest. So long story short, I'd never met any of my cousins, really. Uh, I don't know oh. them. So I do my DNA test and it comes back that I'm Irish and Welsh. And I didn't know that. I thought it was completely English, not Irish, Welsh, Scandinavian and Basque. So up from the Spanish region. Uh -huh. um, I'm, I'm there one day on Facebook <clears throat> and there's a famous uh, guy who works for Disney named Nathan Hughes. And he sends me a message and says, Debbie, I, I'm Nathan Hughes. Uh, you know, I work for Disney and um, 
shows me a photograph of himself like with his Oscar and I thought I thought it was one of those <clears throat> puns you know <laughs> didn't kind yeah. of believe him at first and he said no I'm related your your grandmother and my grandfather a, a brother and sister and I said all oh, right that's brilliant and they popped me into a wow. WhatsApp group. but I didn't tell them what my job was because sometimes if you tell people you work in the paranormal or you work with cryptids you don't oh, really yeah. take it seriously so I wanted to get oh, them yeah. to know first before I told them and I'm in this chat box for about five minutes Nick and my uncle who would be I think Nate he's probably 72 something like that says oh, I've just been to look you up I've seen things my entire life just like you oh, and he wow. me about the things he's told me then his son starts to tell me about the things that have happened to him every single one of them has had experiences with the paranormal or UFO or cryptids throughout life and because we're all fragmented and all over the country nobody's ever sure. put them together my first paranormal experience i remember something frightening me when i was in my cot so i would have been a tiny baby and it'd it come every night and it frightened me i was so scared of it and one night i would lay there and i cried my eyes out and something brushed my head and it just made me feel not scared anymore and i went to sleep wow. so i'm talking I didn't tell anybody this. I hadn't passed it on or anything like that. And I just said to me, Auntie Linda, who's in her 80s, Auntie Linda, have you had paranormal experiences? And she said, no, Deb, I'm more of a knower. I know things and then they come true. But my daughter, Andrea, has had them in her entire life. And it started when she was in a cot as a baby and something mm. struck her head. Oh. You my... know? Yeah. Wow. It's, I honestly believe it runs in your bloodline. I, 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 I got to agree. Yeah, the definitely. I agree with you. Yeah, I, I mean, because that's, are, you, are things more attracted to you because of who you are? Or is it just happenstance that it just happened, that you're in the right place at the right time? Or could it be a combination of both? It but could be. Yeah. It seems I mean, like people that, that yeah. people that have many, many, many different experiences it seems like they're just they just attract it to them. I, I, I agree. And I th also think I don't think that all of the sightings are accidental. It's like we were getting back to before. Why cross in front of the car when you could just wait in the woodland and let that car go by? Right. You know, exactly. right. Why right. step out into the road? How many times do we hear it stepped out? It got to the middle of the road and it turned around and it looked at me. And then it carried on and it went across the road. Or it did the road in two bounds. We hear that all of the time. Yeah, Why right. didn't he do You know, like that thing that I saw. If he hadn't have moved, I wouldn't have seen him. He looked like the green man. He looked like a like he was using the, the leaves somehow as a disguise or a right. to keep him keep himself hidden. And you look at the the the, the legends of the Back then, I'm thinking, he's got to be a caveman, aren't he? That's all he can be. And that's when I discovered the wood wolves or the wood woos. We've been writing in since the 6th century about these man monkeys that lived in Scotland over the border and the Gauls wrote about them and they would steal fish from the nets. They would steal the local women and they were only scared of fire. Now, Native Americans have the exact same legend of that. The, 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 that exactly the same so it was happening in europe in the sixth century and it was happening in the americas in the sixth century before people could talk to each other exactly so, there's no what i always that's what i always say like you've got the the mohawk tribe on the east coast you get the apaches on the west here they are they never would have communicated with each other it's three thousand miles apart but they're describing the same creatures exactly. how is that how is that possible how yeah, it, not, not just yeah. the same description, the same behavior yeah. patterns, same behaviors, the same everything. And you're thinking, yep. right? How, you know, how did they do that back before global communication? They didn't. We accept that they saw them and they made a yeah. note of them. And for them, exactly. it was as natural as anything. It's just yeah. us that don't work on the world. We have a 2024 brain, but that your brain's still there. You know when your wife's upset with you. You know when one of your children are ill or they're telling you a lie. You know when you're in danger, it's in your gut, you feel it, you know, yeah. you feel it. And I think that was natural, it kept you alive back in the day. And you will also yeah. hear people say, everything went deathly silent. Silent. We, were in the, we were, walked into the woods and the woods went 
Like, totally silent, right. Yeah, that means he's an apex predator yeah. around. That yeah, but something you mentioned before about the dog man that crosses the road in front of you. Why not wait till your car passes? Yeah. I've had two instances two years ago where I brought a full full team up there to investigate. North of the Poconos in Pennsylvania, there's a road. It comes to a T. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, cornfields on the right. The road, which is a double wide road, two and two cars can pass, and then a cornfield. Mm -hmm. I've had to go there twice in, the in less than five months. I've had well over 16, 16 witnesses of right. a dog man standing by the roadside, kneeling by the roadside, crossing in front of their car from one side to the next. I I can't think for the life of me. Why do they do that? They, yeah. Their ears are as good as a dog's. Their sense of smell is as good as a dog. They can hear a car coming. Yeah, Why you know, do they want to be seen? And yeah. I got all these people sending me you know, messenger messages, Facebook yeah. messages, emails, calls. Dang. We had to go up twice in a matter of five months. And we did find footprints. We did find claw marks on trees. Uh, it, just, it just, I can't fathom why they would want to be seen. You know, draw the But what you're doing is vital because you're taking a note. We might not get the answer to that, Nick, but we might get it in 10 years. And if we did and you hadn't taken a note of all those people, we'd miss it. So yeah. like sometimes people will say to me, oh, I'm giving up my research and not getting anything. And I say, you don't know. You don't know that you're not getting anything. Stick with it because you don't, you just don't know. We're, we're dealing with creatures that we don't understand. Right. And we're trying to make this jigsaw with like not all of the pieces and no box to look at. But if you just throw it all away, you never learn anything, do you? You've got to kind of go. You got. I just don't. I don't. I'm like you, Nick. I think right. I'm done. I'm not doing it again. And the next day, I'll get an email or someone saying, "Please, can you? I just talked to you. I've gone through this right. thing, and I, mm -hmm. I, I know that the most important thing for them is a validation for me to say, look, I believe you. I get it. You know, you're not yeah. the only one. And then B, try and put them together with someone that's been through a similar experience, mm -hmm. and you just see them blossom because they suddenly know that they're not crazy. Somebody believes oh. them. You you don't. I, I spoke to a guy four weeks ago, Nick, and he said to me, he said, he said, Daddy, I'm Scottish. I'm six foot four. I'm built like a Viking. And I sat in that car and whatever that was at the back, he seen something up the embankment in a tree with red eyes. Right. And he said he didn't know whether it had stood, it was stood up next to the tree like, and he'd seen the eyes or it was up in the tree. He couldn't tell it was that dark, but he was so frightened and oh. I said to him, it's natural. That's completely natural. You're, in, you're not expecting it to happen. It's gone out of the blue. He's, he'd actually gone. It's a famous bridge in Scotland. It's called the Fourth Road Bridge. And his friend had died there. And he'd gone back, really, to think about his friend um, and just reminisce, you know, that kind of thing. And he said he saw it in the rearview mirror. Uh, he saw the red eyes. But when he got out of the car and looked, he couldn't see them. And I said to him, it could have just gone like this. Or it's gone, you know. It, it, it like you said, yeah. the smell you come in, the seat. Why show its eyes? Right. Why see, show its eyes? Why, why? Why do that? I don't know. You know, what, you know what? A lot of people don't understand out there about us. Well, I, I consider myself a Fortean researcher and a cryptozoologist because of all the time I've studied it. Yeah. They've, got to, they've got to understand cryptozoology is not a science of instant gratification. No. No. It's a science of <laughs> no. patience. And research and and field field research and investigation. You're you're out there and you're searching. Um the panda bear, for instance, it yeah. took 65 years to find a panda bear after the first one was seen. Now that's a lot of patience, 65 mm -hmm. years. Look and, at the Billy Eight. Yeah, uh, Billy Eight was yep. <laughs> When the, the late 90s was that was discovered, am I mistaken, or was right. it earlier than that? Yeah, yeah, and the villagers were reporting them for quite a long time, but the exactly biology, you know, knew better than them, said that it wasn't possible, you know, that they, exactly they said, right. I mean, the look at the silverback gorilla, they yeah. said impossible, impossible. Well, that got proven wrong. The Komodo yeah. dragon, there's yeah. only four islands in Indonesia that have Komodo dragons. 
And they thought that all these ship captains that came ashore were, were crazy. There's no such thing as a dragon. Well, yeah, they don't fly, but they sure do look like dragons. Yeah. And they sure yeah. are big and they are vicious. So, I mean, this, the med, ask your relatives, Nick, when you go across, Mediterranean dragons. Mediterranean dragons are very different from Chinese dragons. They oh, were yeah. actually written about by the Romans and they lost a couple of wars because of them because he said these dragons would come out of the sea, come up onto land and would eat people. But they look more lizard like. They didn't have wings like your typical, mm. you know, you, you Welsh dragon or your Chinese dragon. Right. Very Pacific, and they are in the Mediterranean basin. So Greece, oh, wow. Italy, Sicily, um, and they were just talking the Second World War of ships reporting creatures that are bigger than the actual ship that they're on. Yeah, That's you know, true. I've got a ton of questions I'm going to ask them. You know, uh, over meals, of course. Get, the video, get, the, get, get your video camera out. Yeah. But, <laughs> and if they've got books, I've got a cell phone that I'm going to take pictures. I'm bringing yeah. a camera with me or two, actually two cameras okay. so I don't run out. Remember, one is, you know, two is one, one is none. So I'm bringing all yeah. kinds of things. I want to document everything. I want to take pages, pictures of the pages of their books because I don't expect them to let me take them home. No, I know what you mean. Yeah. No, I mean, this would be phenomenal. And and Jay, I'll share the photos. You know, when I come back later on in the year, of what oh, I have if I if I do get anything. But Deb's right. There's there's so much back there that we don't yeah. know. You got to delve into the history. Oh yeah. Deep yeah. into one, it. Though. One string and pull it, Jeremiah. Just keep pulling it, and the whole thing. Yep. Just got to keep pulling. And, oh, and yeah. I, do you know the other thing that I say to people all the time, and I said it to you a long time ago, if you've got the right intent and you're in this for the right reason, mm. then it'll come to you. It'll come to you. And it yes. has to happen it, you know, because you're not out there trying to con people and you're not out there trying to make money. You're just being right. a genuine guy with a genuine interest speaking to genuine witnesses. And That's right. it, someone will always hit your inbox. You know, because they see okay. what you're doing and they think these guys are decent, they'll understand me. You know, they'll yeah. you yeah. took it, you took a gamble on me back in the day where people didn't even believe there was Bigfoot in the UK, and, and 90% of the world still doesn't believe it. But you said to me that you recognized that I was a witness that I'd seen something, yep, because I couldn't let it go, Nick. I need to know what he is, how he eats, right. how you know, that's how I deal with problems in life. I pull them apart, I have to see. What they are, and I think I've been doing that for forty-two years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, Deb, you have the right idea. I've, I've spoken it's with a good thing. I've spoken with Jay so many times about the subject that uh, you know, if your heart is there, if you're yeah. pure, if you're just in it for the research and for the information, Jay doesn't do it for anything but the research. Same with me. Same Does with it? you. I yeah. do not do it for the money. We don't. We, the only reason why we do these podcasts is to put out information. Get the word out, sure. yeah. That's, That's the only idea. reason why. And I never try to make money off of this. I lose money. I mean, cryptozoology is a yeah. science of losing money on, on something you love to do. Yeah. And that's that's what real. we do out there. We try to put out information. And when we interview people like yourself and others, you know, we're, we're very happy that we're bringing good info out there. And it might be another piece to the puzzle. They, again, exactly. there will be an, there will be somebody out there tonight who's in England who thinks they're the only one, and they'll be like, right, well, I'm going to yeah. message you because that always happens when I do. But I thought I was the only one. I thought I was the only person in the world that had seen what I saw. So when I got validation, it was like, oh, I'm not crazy. Somebody else has seen what I've seen in right. the same area, and I'll never forget that feeling. And I'll do that for as many people as I can. And I'm open still doing this when I'm in my 90s. <laughs> That's great. We're very glad to know you too, I'll tell you. Absolutely. Jay, we've actually run out of film time here, but we have. Um, Deb, with your permission, possibly do a part two. Because yeah, not... I, I still have a bunch of questions. I, I yeah, to, you too. <laughs> I wanted to hear your origins, but if you would, you know, maybe be able to come by on again in the future. Yeah. I'd really appreciate that. I I will be. You just let me know, and I'll make sure I'll be there for you. Don't you worry about that. And if anybody's awesome. listening and they've got any questions, pop them over to Jay and 
and Nick, and he can ask me the next time I come on. Yeah, not a problem. Yeah, oh, that'd be fantastic. Awesome, fantastic, and that'd be fantastic. And and I got to tell everybody in the International Dogman Project UK, Deb puts out tons and tons of information out there for us. I really appreciate her being on on the team yeah. out there with us. It's it's fantastic. For sure. I mean, she's she's all over the place in it. Deb, if you could hold on after we go off the air, just a yeah. few questions. Yeah, that's fine. Jay, take it. <laughs> yeah, all right, Deb, thank you so much once again. We appreciate it so much. Thanks for all the work you do with IDP. Thank um, you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on with us. And it was an honor to speak to you again. Uh, it's been a while, but it was, it was great to see you again, Deb. Yeah, and, it was an um, It was good to see you. And uh, we will uh, have a good night, everyone. God bless. And treat each other well. And we will see you again next weekend. Everybody, Everyone have a good night. Bye-bye, Deb. Bye-bye, Jay.